All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, serving online information entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and the world. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. We are going to have a super fun conversation today on especially one particular point that is a major problem in most businesses. So I'm super excited to introduce Lynn Whitbeck. Welcome, Lynn. Hi, Heather. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, yeah, so great to see you again. I'm happy to, I'm, you know, it's so funny because when I first connect with people and then we actually get around to the call, like often <laughs> many months have passed and it's like, I want to do all this catching up, which we will do on the conversation today. So great to have you back. For those of you that don't know Lynn, Lynn Whitbeck is the queen of sales. Business owners hire Lynn to ignite winning sales teams because most are chasing down clients stuck in a chaotic sales cycle and lacking client retention, conversions, and profits. So she helps transform thinking to the client's perspective, end sales chaos with a robust strategic plan to harvest the hidden profits. Bottom line, Lynn will ignite your sales and unleash lasting profits. Woohoo! Lynn's core value is to be of service. It's what drives her. Every morning she wakes up and says, there are so many things I get to do today. Lynn is the founder and CEO of Petite to Queen, and you may have seen Lynn in USA Today, Huffington Post, Chicago Tribune, and more. When she is not working with clients, Lynn loves visiting national parks. That's a big one on our list cooking and playing Pokemon Go. Well, if you're into cooking, you can come to our house, Lynn. <laughs> that one is one that I want to be on my list and is definitely not currently on my list. Um, Pokemon Go is on the list for my son, Aiden, who is just turned 10. He's been obsessed with Pokemon for years now. And of course has the little sister who's four also very interested in Pokemon. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, in Seattle, they've got the big event coming up in two weeks. Um, actually now at this point, a week and a half where you can buy tickets to get into the Seattle center area where it's just, they've literally rented the whole thing and it's just Pokemon. It's like Pokemon it, it, heaven. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> So uh, it's sorry as I cough cough, but no. my daughter and I are planning to go and uh, we're pretty excited about it. So, I mean, you know, if you live in that world, <laughs> right? Well, it is, it's, ho it's whole own world. The funny thing is, you know, not funny. So COVID hit that part is not funny, but having to explore all of these ways to support kids online, right? Like the first summer where we were looking at summer camps, I ended up putting Aiden into a couple of online camps, including Pokemon, um, Minecraft, right? Some of those that he was learning at the time. And it was like a whole other world. I had like, I was such the bad mom at the time because I didn't realize I had to like download and install all this software. And <laughs> anyways, folks, it's a whole thing. If you don't know about the world, it is, a, I mean, the, the Pokemon world, it is a whole thing. Um, well, Lynn, I'm super excited to have you here today. I love what we are about to talk about. And I know, you know, we chatted before about this super important, you know, um, I'll get right to the point. Like we're here to talk about sales. Also what causes chaos in a business and our tremendous lack of follow-up right before you and I went live, we were just sharing experiences <laughs> of having to go car shopping. And I was sharing like, what a tremendous lack of follow-up did for that experience and what I did after that. So anyways, Lynn, um, I'd love for you to share why sales, why is sales the thing for you? How did you get your start in sales? What is it about sales that you love? Share with us a little bit about your background. <laughs> I started in sales as a Girl Scout selling cookies, you know, uh, and, uh, um, I absolutely, uh, first of all, they're great cookies. So it's a wonderful <laughs> yes. product that you can get behind and be passionate about. And, uh, we had this coveted cookie badge that you had to sell so many cookies to get this cookie badge. And I hauled my friend around who was probably one of the most, uh, introverted, shy individuals. Um, but we made a great team. I was the one out there meeting and greeting and grabbing them. And she was the one giving them the cookies and taking the money. And we were the only two girls in um, 
you know, that, that, uh, that whole like sort of Seattle area that year who got that coveted cookie badge. <laughs> so uh, that's like in a pace of prominence, I still have my Girl Scout sash. So I, you know, that's how I sort of got started. But uh, sales for me was always uh, just an absolute natural fit because I do, I love to help people. I love to be of service. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about sales is that not only do I help my clients, but in turn, they're helping their clients. They're helping the businesses that they work with or the individuals that they work with, um, the communities that they work with. And, and I create a wave, they add to that wave and those people then get to make that wave even bigger. Mm -hmm. And so it goes from a ripple into a wave. And that's really tremendous when you can have that kind of impact. And so many, when you have a product or service that you truly believe in and you're passionate about, it's one of the best things in the world uh, because you are creating, uh, making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, you know, it's so interesting to think about everything that goes into the sales process, right? What comes before, what comes after, why is it that we all fall down so much on the follow-up? Oh, well, I think we need to back it up a little bit because the first thing that happens is that many companies haven't really thought through their whole sales strategy. Mm -hmm. And when you start with that and you actually build out your sales strategy, um, then it's a lot easier to do your follow-up because that's part of your sales strategy. Per and when you start, it's really thinking like the client, you know, what does the client mm -hmm. want, need, or lack? You know, why does it matter to them? What area of concern is it addressing? What problem is it solving? Um, you know, you know, what's in it for them and mm. ultimately so they can, so they can what? So when we were talking about the car, um, you had an older car that was becoming unreliable. So you needed a reliable vehicle, but you needed a vehicle for family and for adventuring, you know, so as you get into it, you know, what do you want, need or lack? Why does it matter to you? And why do certain car features matter to you? Mm -hmm. And then so you can, so you can get the whole family and the dogs and everybody in there and then go out and go up to, you know, let's say you're going to go up highway 20, right. And you're going to go and uh, check in at, uh, at Lake Ross, you know, whatever it happens to be, or go up to Diablo. And so there are all kinds of, since we're both Washington natives, I yeah. can do that for those of you who haven't been visited the beautiful state of Washington in the United States anyway. Uh, but that's the thing, you know, you sort of get to that. So you can, cause that's really what you're purchasing as you're purchasing the, so you can. Right. Right. And so when you start with that philosophy and that is going to help you uh, not only help you, but it's, it, it's absolutely critical that you think like the client and also think mm -hmm. like the client throughout the client journey, because mm -hmm. what they're thinking changes from that initial connection to the spark, whatever that is to them cultivating the relationship to guiding them to a decision where they're at when you're, you're making that decision to buy that car is different from when you first started looking, right? right. A whole bunch of things have gone on. And mm -hmm. so you need to have that in consideration and to include that. And then of course, as they've become the client and you're nurturing that relationship so that you can get warm referrals for people to tell, for mm -hmm. you to tell people what a great ex, uh, experience that you had at the car dealership, who you worked with, mm -hmm. um, because that in turn is going to then come back around and feed the sales process. It's going to shorten that sales cycle um, because those warm referrals are, they make decisions faster because they already have a basis of understanding who you are. Right. I mean, so this is, so we're going full circle here, No, but it, you're giving us a great <laughs> look because even when you said the word sales strategy, I was like, mm, I bet a people, I bet a lot of people get that piece wrong. What is a sales strategy? What all, because right. Then you're getting to referrals. You talk about thinking like the client designing a system that really works from the client perspective, you know, and then all the way to the point of once they're enrolled, you know, nurturing that so that you can also collect warm referrals, like take great care of the client that you've created, but also collect warm referrals. And I think some people think, well, isn't that a different strategy? That's a referral strategy, right? And I'm nope. hearing you say nope. that's part of the sales strategy. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. And in fact, with referrals, you need to be seeding referrals at the beginning mm -hmm. and all the way through the relationship. So that by the time that you've earned the right 
to ask for the referral, they're ready and willing. They want to share this experience with someone else and you've been seeding it all the way along. It's not like it's a surprise. Mm. So, um, and you, you make it easy for them, you know, yeah. and then you recognize and reward them for the referral that they've provided so that because once someone does become a referral, they're four times more likely to refer again. Yeah. And yeah. someone who's been referred to you is also far more likely to refer somebody new to you as well. So mm. it's just, a, you know, it just really creates this beautiful network. Um, and to do that, though, you have to have thought through your strategy. And that right. also includes that follow up piece that you talked about. If you don't know what the client is thinking, how are you going to be able to deliver the value that they need so that you can cultivate the relationship to guide them to a decision? Mm -hmm. Right. And then even when they've made the decision, there's still follow up for all the whether it's contracts to be signed, mm -hmm. uh, negotiation that has to occur, implementation, onboarding, um, the delivery of the vehicle, follow up for that first appointment when the car comes back in that they do a full points checkup, whatever it happens to be. You know, that is still part of the client journey and follow up is part of your job in sales. Um, right. Well, and, you have and, different kinds of follow up, right? So you say yeah. the word follow up, and it's like looking at the example we were talking about where you have a lead, right? How many people are fall, falling down on the follow up just in regards to leads, right? Rather, like, rather than nurturing the leads they have and doing adequate follow-up, instead pivoting and looking at other leads, how to other bring new leads in the door. And then once you've done whatever the initial service, product delivery, whatever it is, how many people forget they have a list sitting there of folks that they've already served once that they could follow up with learn more about that particular journey or client and, you know, serve them in some other way. I just remember, and the reason I'm so caught up on this issue of follow-up is because I remember hearing really awful statistic about the percentage of businesses that do not do this well and how much business they're losing by ignoring this one point. Yeah, no, I mean, we talked about that briefly before the show, but the statistics are really quite shocking that 48% of salespeople don't follow up once. It's like one so, out of two. Yeah. So they'll meet somebody at a conference or at a trade show. They'll meet them in a car dealership. They'll, you know, they actually have a phone call meeting, whatever it happens to be. And they never follow up. I mean, you know, and, and is this just having a lack of a system? Is it a product of time? What, what do you uh, think? There's so your... many different reasons about why people fail to follow mm -hmm. up. Now, one, they could get busy with other things. I mean, I think I, I can truthfully say that I'm pretty good at follow-up and yet I still suck because I'll get busy with existing clients and hot projects and yeah. people who are literally throwing money at me. So I need to take care of them. Um, so there are more than one side to that. But mm -hmm. another piece is that some people don't they hate the rejection. You know, mm -hmm. salespeople in general, want to feel the love, you know, they want to be, to, it, it's just sort of this piece that it, it's not for everyone, but it mm -hmm. is a common trait. And so there's going to be that rejection, right? You have to be resilient. You have to be able to get back up. You also in sales, you get ghosted where people don't respond. And, mm -hmm. and really it's because they're busy. They're really, yep. really busy. Yep. Um, but there's also another piece is they don't know what to give them. Or they're doing something like, oh, hi, Heather, this is Lynn. I'm calling from the Ford dealership. And well, I just thought I'd check in and see, you know, if you're, you're ready to come in and take another look at that, that Ford, you know. Okay. So first of all, you, it, you are like already like, oh my, I just went off this voicemail, let alone if, you know, cause it's usually voicemail. Come on. Yeah. Um, and then at the end she goes, then they go. Oh, and by the way, this is Lynn. Blah, 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 blah. And you're going like, what the heck? All right. They just gave that phone number and who they are so fast that I will have to listen to this 10 times. I still won't get it. You are so dead to me. Okay. So just, <laughs> you know, so what you need to do is of course you lead with that follow-up. You have to know that's what is that? What is it that you're looking mm -hmm. for? And so it could be that you're following up and that you've just got this new road and track report that came in about the off-road vehicle capabilities when you're taking it camping. 
um, as, because if they've done any kind of work, when they talk to you and ask mm -hmm. questions, um, and that you could provide that, you could also say, oh, and I don't know if you're, about, you know, I'm so excited about this. I want to tell you about this. And then, oh, by the way, this is Lynn, Lynn Whitbeck with the Ford dealer. And then you leave. So you slow your cadence down. You mm -hmm. go, this is Lynn. And then you immediately slow it way down because 90% of people have some form of dyslexia. So then you slow it way down as to who it is. Did you just say 90%? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And it, it's often, it's so mild that it doesn't impact a lot of things, but it's there. And so mm. when you're aware of that, I mean, that's the thing you want them to get your digits again or who you right. are and you slow it down so they can. Yes. Uh, but then it's like, you do this triumphant triangle. I'm going to put this all in an email for you so that you have it right. And you basically mm. have everything in an email. You're almost reading from the email, but please don't read like you're reading a script, <laughs> you know, but you already know what that is. You send it on to them. Right. And so then you click send and then three days later, three business days later, it depends on every business. The cadence would be different. Mm. Um, you will follow up again. And so there you can leave a message with them. If you've connected with them on LinkedIn or on Facebook, or you've got their message to send them a text message, you, you do a different type of communication. So you hit them three different ways uh, because people will pick up on that. Now, yes. even if they still ghost you, I want everybody to remember it's probably because they're busy, 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 busy. So mm -hmm. then it's like, well, what's next? You know, so when you've done the strategy and you figured it out, so these are the types of buyers for this vehicle, right? In this case, we've been talking about cars. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are the kinds of assets that we could deliver to them, the value that can be delivered? So another great thing is that, our, do you know that we have, you know, a local dealer um, explorer club that we go on day trips, you know, and our next day trip is on this. If you'd like to join in and see what it's all about, you know, all are welcome, whether you've purchased from us or not. I mean, that's the type of thing that people are, oh, this is this fun outing, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to send an email with all the details so that you can register, you know? And so when we used to have a, um, when my husband was alive, we had a big boat. And so the boat dealership did these boat trips and they did them multiple times a year. And so you just all sort of convene at one spot and then you all sort of motor together, this little cavalcade of, of, of boats, right? And so, but that's like a different way to add value. You're adding value with community. Mm -hmm. You're being able to meet new people. Um, and you're also able, to, I mean, so there's all kinds of ways. I want everybody to think outside of the box of your product or service. Mm -hmm. There's many different ways that you can deliver and add value, but you've got to have that, know what the client is thinking and why it matters to them and then plan it in the cadence and where it, it's the best fit. Cause that's also a great thing to add on in this case of a car at the end mm -hmm. of doing these types of activities. Well, it's so true. And you know, the other thing that comes to mind while you mention all these ways you can add value, which is, you know, also really just about building relationships, yes. right? <laughs> it's it, you, like, you can call it add value. It's really about showing, demonstrating that you've paid attention to their wants, to their needs, to what they told you and letting them know that matters to you and you can help them. Right. I think of to go back to this recent example. And I was telling Lynn before the call, like I haven't had to car shop in like 20 years, you know, and I got a Volvo PS. I love Volvos. Um, but it's done a great job. And we're at a point where it's just not a great family car anymore. Cause it's not that reliable. We've worn it right out and our other car doesn't have four wheel drive. So we ended up at a car dealership where we spent several hours with them. If they were paying attention, right. They would have learned we ha have not only one car to replace, but two in our household in the very near future. That's, that's over, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in sales, given the types of vehicles we're looking at, they would have learned that we are a family that love the outdoors, spend lots of time in nature. There's reasons why we need a four wheel drive vehicle, right? All of this stuff. And yet, and the other thing that I was about to say though, is that even if the purchase is not going to be made tomorrow. The reality is they lost my business because they did not follow up. They did not demonstrate that whether my business was coming for them tomorrow, next month, or next year, that they're good at follow-up, right? So 
they they didn't respond to phone calls. They didn't. I submitted a, you know some information online. I did not get a follow up call or email. Nothing. Three or four days later, and even though we're not buying a car because the way that car production is happening right now is unless you're going to walk off the lot with it, which is not for us because yeah. you know we're looking for something fairly specific. It's just not available. You have to order it and then wait some time, right? But we ended up going to another dealership to test drive the version of the vehicle that we want. And then just based on the pure level of responsiveness, you know, emails within the hour, you know, very, very responsible, multiple emails throughout the day. Here's the information. Here's how we can help. Even the way that he answered questions on the lot, I was like, oh, this, this dealership clearly knows how to follow up. They care about our business, right? They're in another city. And yet that's who we're going to be going with. So you know, the, it's just a really clear example of the importance of follow-up and regardless of when that business could be coming your way, if you fall down on the follow-up, you've just lost a sale, you know, in, yeah. in many instances. Oh, absolutely. And the key thing about, uh, most people, it's like, uh, a significant portion, usually at least 80% are not ready to make a decision that right. moment or that day. Right. And so, um, and depending on the type of sales, certainly like in a corporate sales environment, <laughs> that always takes longer, right? Uh, so when you're looking at sales in that process of follow-up, it is about building those relationships. I mean, it is all mm -hmm. about that human to human connection um, and, you know, thinking that through. And so a real great tip and shortcut for the audience, if you're looking at how to put together materials for follow-up is to think about your, your, the top 10 pain points, the top 10 questions that you get and the top 10 objections. Okay. And then look at those and then take, what are the top three, you know, prioritize them. And once again, not from your perspective. All right. You've got to get out of your own thinking, think like the client from their perspective. And there's a number of ways that you can, that can help you uh, quickly um, evaluate that and see if you're on track. Um, within, you know, a couple of days or a couple of weeks. But once you have that, you can take those top three. Do we have materials that answer these? Have mm. we already done something? Is there something we can refine or tweak? You know, and then that becomes part of your follow-up cadence. And if you, if you're missing that, if that's a gap, then you create something. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind people that you don't, just because you create one piece of content, um, and you have one piece of content, I want you to, once again, you can repurpose that content. So this is sort of like, here I am guesting on a podcast. But one of the things I provide is I have a, a, a masterclass on how to leverage guest podcasting to grow your business. Mm -hmm. Now that started out as a summit presentation. So I did a presentation on a summit I took that and I turned that into, then I, right after that, I got a request for an article and I did an article on that. Well, then I took that article and I repurposed the article again for our own website, right? Then I created a, a, a literally a process map of how to do it, right? And then from there, I, I mean, I'm just, I literally went on other podcasts talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. Then I created the masterclass and, and then, it, so as you can see, they're just, it just, and then now there's like a quick checklist. So it just goes on. And the thing is people digest and absorb content in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so some people may, the article may be great. Other people want a, a single one sheet checklist. You know, they want that quick hit and a lead magnet should always include something that is that piece that can be digested in three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but then some people want to spend more time and they want to go through, although my masterclass is like 20 minutes, so it's not super long, but um, you know, but it's also divided into four videos. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing is that some people will sit through a longer bite, but smaller bites are more effective. Yeah. And so as you go through those things, just, you know, it's different types of content and all of those things, literally you could create video snippets that then can become something that you put into a sequence that goes out. You could take that masterclass. That's less than an hour total time. I think it's less than 20 minutes, but you could literally divide it up into even smaller snippets and you could post on social every day. 
right. you know, almost like a challenge. So mm-hmm. I, you know, that's the thing you can repurpose content and you, you think, oh, well, somebody will know that I've, I've already used that. They'll see it before. Not always. And sometimes the different format is better for them. And so that's why in marketing, you'll reuse the same message over and over again so that people get used to it. All right. Yeah. It's the same thing. That's why you keep following up because what's really a killer is that 92% of salespeople give up after the fourth attempt of follow-up and they haven't made a sale. And yet most sales occur after the fifth follow-up. And depending on the type of industry you're in, that could be seven, mm-hmm. it could be 12, it could be 13, whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm. I always recommend clients create a 13 step follow up process that Baker's dozen um, before they, uh, and these are personalized follow ups that are still templated that they've planned out that can be easily and quickly delivered in five minutes or less by the salesperson and yet um, feel authentic and genuine and human to human. And after 13, well, then you can put them into a drip campaign. Okay. And, you know, but before that, and then if they warm up and they do the outreach, then, you know, because some people, sometimes it takes a while. Yeah. Some businesses, people have to be in the funnel for about a year to really generate like, well, they really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I really like what they're doing. Right. They have to really be in your orbit. I've noticed the same thing. Like, so many introductions that I meet that I know, cause I can take an outward look at their business and tell like that, like they don't have what they need when it comes to legal stuff. And so I know right away, can I help this person? But wait, what they don't know is, you know, they, they don't yet have, they don't know who I am, right? They're not yet comfortable being in the conversation, maybe around legal services. It just takes some time, but ultimately if you stay in orbit with that person and have some regular contact, it is, it's, it's very much like I love, and I hope people are writing down notes on that 13 (laughs) step follow-up system, just even as a reminder about how, how much consistency matters, even though you said each step could be a five minute step, right? So collectively that's not that much. Yeah. Cause I want you to once again, think like a client, what are you Mm -hmm. actually telling them when you do that? you're letting them know what it's going to be like to work with you. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're going to be, you're going to follow up, that you're going to be consistent, that you're going to be credible, that you're going to be capable. I mean, all of these things are being relayed to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's another piece that's very important um, as you're going through this, even when you're going through a rapid, you know, follow-up process, because it doesn't have to be spread out over a year. Right. Um, It can be spread out over a month or two months. Every business, your cadence will be unique for your Mm. business. Um, And and there's a little bit of part about uh, individuals who how much or little they want to email or phone or Mm. the cadence. But, um, you know, honestly, reaching out once a week or every other week, um, you know, that that is absolutely when you are delivering value Mm. um, and you're not, you're not, it's really you're giving, 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 um, then you're going to get a response. Yeah, I love that. For folks that are sitting down and going, gosh, maybe I don't really have a comprehensive sales strategy, right? I've got pieces of it, components of it, but like clearly there are some things that are missing. Where do you have people look or what are the big potholes? I think follow-up is one of them, but what are the big potholes that people step into? Well, the first one is really client thinking. Many, Mm -hmm. many clients have not truly thought through the process from their client's perspective. And they haven't taken the time to build because that is your rock foundation. If you're thinking about instead of a car, a house, um, a house sits on a stone foundation or a a cement foundation. And that foundation also has to have time to cure, right? Before you plop the house on top. So one of the key things is understanding that client thinking going in, because that's going to make sure that you're attracting the right people, you're connecting to them. It's going to shorten your sales cycle. And when you, and that in turn lowers your cost of acquisition, client acquisition and increases your profits. So, I mean, it's, it's just a win, 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 win. Um, right. But it's sort of like investing that bit of a time, just like in legal, if you don't invest the time to put these things in place, well, there is a pretty big downside on that, that can come back and hit you hard. So it's, uh, and it doesn't need to be onerous or hard, but it's just, you know, it's like anything else. When you plan, 
and you put that in place, everything else flows so much easier and more smoothly. Mm -hmm. Well, and this piece about really knowing your clients, speaking to them so that they identify themselves in your services, right? So one small change that I made, that's been a big difference. And I, I didn't really think about it for a long time, but when I was having conversations with potential clients, I would start to say, if you are in this revenue range, here's what I've learned, right? These are the issues that you're facing. This is typically where you are at on your, you know, your path to scaling. Now, if you're in this revenue range, right, here's some other things, plus the solutions for those things. And people then quickly identify like, oh yeah, that's me. And, and it has changed because there's a, there's a program that I launched. That's a $25,000 program doing the same stuff I've always done. I've just put it into a structure but when I, when I clearly identify the client, like people in that are a fit for this program are doing X, Y, Z, they're in this revenue range. These are the issues. That conversation is just as fast and just as easy as putting somebody into a $1,500 solution, right? It is, it's so important that I think we talk to clients in a way that allows them to identify themselves as like, yeah, th that's right. That this is me. This sounds like the solution that I need, right? It sounds like it will fix the specific problems that I'm facing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, one thing you mentioned that really piques my interest because it was not on the list, but now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, people heard that and they're going to be freaking out. Like, let's talk about referrals, right? So sales <laughs> strategy, and I'm, I just want to be respectful of time because I'm sure we could go, you know, much deeper into sales strategy, right? Thinking like your client, designing a system that has at least 13 steps in the follow-up <laughs> <laughs> in the well, follow -up a com yeah, a combination of outreach follow-up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. But just understanding. And, and I also love that you say it's going to look different for every business. I think yeah. a lot of people think like, just give me the system. And especially if I can automate it. Right. But what I'm hearing you say is no, it needs to be specific. It needs to be personal. It needs to be really tailored to your client and your business it might look different for everybody. Yeah. It, that's what gives you a competitive edge. Yeah. So that people know you're speaking to them and you're connecting with them on that level. Um, mm -hmm. People today are smart. They know when they're in a drip campaign. Totally. Oh yeah. And, you know? and superhuman knows and, and Gmail knows. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just, you know, all you're doing is taking a beautiful plate of spaghetti and you're just taking it and throwing it against the wall and see if anything sticks. Mm -hmm. Okay. I personally would rather be served that beautiful plate of spaghetti with some garlic bread and some asparagus and a beautiful Caesar salad on the side. Right. So folks, I hope you just paid attention to that. How many people are dropping folks into a drip campaign thinking this is sufficient. And, you know, one of the things I've done in my business that really has made a world of difference, both from efficiency, but also to achieve that personal outreach is just create templates inside of Gmail. And what it does is allow me to kind of create the core of the message, but then I can add all the personal details yeah. of like, it was so great to talk to you, you know, early this week, you know, and we mentioned this specifically, this specifically, here's some information that might help you in your decision-making, right. Or whatever, but being able to really have it be a personal touch, I think makes yeah. a complete world of difference. Yeah. Templates are huge. And there's so many different ways that you can do those. You can even templatize, you know, like videos where mm -hmm. it's the video has been recorded, but you're actually using a tool like SendSpark to customize the header and the footer. So it's coming, it looks like it's for them, but it's a video that you've pulled from a video library. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's why I said, you can do these things where it takes a salesperson five minutes, yeah. you know, to, to yeah. get it out there. But um, it, it's just as takes the planning so that it's available and you're making your sales team so much more effective mm -hmm. and you're quickening your sales cycle and um, yes. increasing the profit as a result, because you're lowering your cost of client acquisition and seeding those referrals in the process. Oh, no, it's exactly right. I mean, it's like, it's so interesting because when you think about examples in your own business of when 
the process has gone right for you. Like that shortening the sales cycle is huge, right? And and part of that does take planning about when things are going to happen so that you're doing that follow-up quickly. And and when it doesn't happen in that order, like it's so noticeable or in the time frame, right? Like I have a specific, um, and this is a little bit different than a sales cycle, but similar because truthfully, this service is part of my sales cycle. I actually have a front end service that's a business risk assessment, and it leads to divulging all the other problems in the business, right? So it's one of the initial steps. It's a service, but also part of truthfully, the comprehensive sales cycle. And usually I'm scheduling the follow-up call within about a week of the first meeting. Well, I had one client that was really particularly difficult to get scheduled. So that didn't happen for like six weeks, not because of my schedule, because of hers. But what did she do once we finally got on that second call? Complained about how much time had passed between the, (laughs) which I, you know, I just sat there thinking, oh my gosh, isn't this ironic, right? I, it, it made me tighten up my own policies about like when I schedule the first one, we have to automatically schedule the second one. And if they're not occurring within a week of each other, we need to reschedule, right? It's the, the timing is super important. And another recent example is when I did it right with another client completed everything in a really timely manner, got the summary over to him. Literally, I sent the summary last night and this morning I get an email back. That all sounds great. Yes. Let's please proceed. This is to my $25,000 program, right? That's it. Single email line. Yes, let's please proceed. Tell me how, right? So it, it that that shortened sales cycle saves so much time and energy and additional follow up, right? It's yeah. um, it really makes a difference, especially in a small business where you may not have a big team to do all that stuff for you. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's a key thing is that when you're doing that, you can be implementing this on the fly, so that mm-hmm. you are making continuous process improvements. And before you know it, you've got things built out, but you actually started somewhere. Oh, I love that. The implementing on the fly. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I think there was a pause in our video. No, Um, that's okay. But yeah. (laughs) Yes. The implementing on the fly though. I think people need to hear that piece because they think like, oh, well maybe I can't start if I don't have this big system all built out and perfected. And you're saying, no, do it and iterate along the way, create the assets along the way, create the follow-up along the way. And then pretty soon you've done that a few times and you do have a system. Yeah. And then you get uh, one thing done and then you start on the next, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, um, you know, this is not a linear line. Mm -hmm. Um, I want people to think about it more as since we've been talking about cars, you got a roadmap with all kinds of roads and all kinds of routes (laughs) to get there. There's a whole bunch of different ways to get to Spokane from Seattle. Once again, (laughs) using the Washington state analogy. And I know, cause I've taken a whole bunch of them, the road less traveled, Mm -hmm. you know, all Mm -hmm. kinds of different ways and you get to see all kinds of different things. Right. Right. But the whole point is that you're. Uh, you can do this and be implementing and making and process improvements and seeing those results. And then you just keep, you just keep doing that incrementally adding on. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's always in that first thing is sort of, you know, in that moment of what is the most pressing Um, client Mm -hmm. thinking and understanding your client thinking has to be a core part. And then what is like an opportunity that's right here or a big gap that you're aware of. Um, uh, so, and then you are a challenge that you need to address. What is it that, you know, is that, you know, first thing, the low hanging fruit that needs to be addressed. Mm, Yeah. So, I mean, there's so much good stuff there. So a couple of burning questions that I still have, and I'm hoping even if you can just shed some insights on like one or two key points, it will really help our listeners. One, I want to get to the issue of chaos. What causes chaos in And let's specifically focus on small businesses, right? Small businesses who are trying to really dial in their sales, their sales systems. Talk to us a little bit about chaos. Well, in many small businesses, um, certainly there's been the founder magic, getting started and doing the sales. And then as they brought in a sales team, um, often they're almost like little mini entrepreneurs and they're doing their own thing. And there really isn't this cross communication because there's also a competitive nature to the different salespeople Mm. and what they're trying to achieve. And so the first thing is, is that, you know, 
Tom doesn't know what Harriet's doing and Harriet may have found a really good solution for something. Uh, and Tom may know how to do something else, but they're not really, you know, working as a team or collaborating. Yeah. And so that occurs. Um, also, you know, there's a side of where the small business is you get people, even in a small business sort of siloed and they don't mm-hmm. recognize how they all touch the client because accounting touches the client by sending them invoices, following up on mm-hmm. payment, um, obviously shipping, uh, uh, you know, and how the pa- something is packaged or, or, and, or delivered if they're delivering it with their own, a local delivery service or their own truck, mm-hmm. et cetera, uh, or how something is being manufactured. Um, all these things, you know, that client experience and how they're touching the client, almost everyone in a facility, the janitor impacts the client experience if they come into the facility and they use the restroom, you know, right. come on. Yes. So how that is impacting the client and really having everyone in, um, every business should be client focused because they drive your business. All right. They drive the decisions. They drive the business. But in a small business, this is more vital than ever. Mm. And um, I I would say it's vital no matter what size of organization you have. Um, Mm. But uh, in, you know, in a small business, really getting everybody on board with thinking like the client and the client experience and the journey that they'll have Mm. as they work with them and how important that is and that they're all in the same team to deliver that client delight. Mm. Uh, that really makes a difference and that will have an impact, um, for the whole organization when they don't think of it as like, well, I'm just manufacturing this thing that I'm going to pass over to, to this department to do the finishing. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I mean, this is going to be going into someone's, I mean, their home or, you know, whatever it happens to be, if they're a manufacturer or if it's a service that they're delivering, whatever it happens to be, but you need to get that is a mindset piece that is really critical that the entire organization from top down participates in to serve, to serve the client. I mean, why they're, what they're doing, what they're doing and the impact that they're having. I mean, some Mm -hmm. people may think, well, I'm just manufacturing this widget, this car part. Well, no, this car part actually makes the car safer. You're actually helping a family be safe on the road. Mm -hmm. All right. What is the impact that you're actually delivering? Um, And so those are things that when, uh, and then you have that in, you know, like, how can we, you know, how does this impact the client? How can this be better? If something goes wrong, it's like, well, what's that? I mean, I know we all talk about the root cause, but how is it also impacting the client that this went sideways? Well, and, you know, when you talk about this top-down approach of getting the messaging right from the top, enrolling your employees and your support staff in the mission of the company and rolling them into not only observing, but participating in the client experience. I think it just, you, you end up having a team that's so much more committed because they are part of the whole, they're not siloed. They're not just, you know, it reminds me of a story in my husband's business. He's an employee for a a local business here in Seattle. And through COVID, I think a lot of people got siloed. They, they weren't showing up to in-person stuff. They were working odd hours there. You know, I think a lot of people and managers had to shift styles on how they manage people. And if they were just assuming somebody had it down or had it covered, you know, there was one employee in particular in my husband's department that was fairly problematic and, you know, they've had to get him back in line, but it was like, once he understood kind of the management structure, the, I think it was really the team feeling like, oh yeah, there are other people that have eyeballs on my work that care about what I do. You know, we were just talking recently about his work is totally turned around. He's come up very proactively with ideas for how you can do this better. And here I actually created this SOP for this particular procedure that we didn't have, you know, it really changes the way people show up in your business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because they're part of something bigger. Yes. Yeah, it's hugely critical. So um, I love that. And the the other thing that I still want to touch on, because I'm sure in people's mind, they're like, oh my gosh, please tell me more about referrals and how you build some of these really, you know, key, they could be small, but I'm sure they're very key parts of the conversation with the client into the sales system. Do you want to talk for a minute about referrals? Yeah. So referrals, um, you know, are, there's 
two, I mean, there's three critical pieces. First, mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to earn the right. Next, you need to ask for the referral. And third, you need to reward and recognize, recognize mm -hmm. and reward um, when you've received a referral. Uh, but the, that beyond that, you have to have incorporated this into your sales process so it becomes part of your DNA. And so a very simple way to do that right up the, the gate is, you know, Heather, it's so great that we've connected today and we're having this incredible conversation because, you know, what's really interesting is most of the time when I meet new people, it's because they've been referred to me mm -hmm. by a client. And I, I just, the rapport that we've had has just blown my mind. And I really appreciate that. Well, I just seeded the idea that most of my mm -hmm. new conversations are coming from referrals. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's just one super simple way. But what you're doing is that when you think this through, um, at what's surprising is most companies, like 90% of the companies will say, oh, we have a referral process in place. Yeah, no, you don't. Well, now, in, I, actu I was gonna... in, in actuality, it's like less than 10% really train on referrals and put that in place. So, mm. but this is one of the surest ways to shorten your sales cycle and increase your profit. Okay. Mm. Is with so you, referrals and creating a referral network. So you seed it in the conversations early on by mentioning referrals. Mention it early, mention it often. Yeah. And then you said that, I, and I think you said at some point, there's a really key time when it's the right time to ask for referrals, right? Yeah. Normally after someone has made the decision to move forward and to work mm -hmm. with you, um, is the optimum. And in some cases, in some types of businesses that can be within those first two hours. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is that you've actually earned the right and that you've been seeding it all the way along. And then you can ask if, you know, Heather, do you know somebody who would like to have the same experience that you've had as having me as a guest on your show? You have another podcast host that would like to have this same type of conversation. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, well, yeah, I know 10 other podcast hosts and they'd love to have you on the show. And so you know? are you saying, so, and you know, the podcast <laughs> example I get, but I thought I heard you say as soon as they enroll. So before you've even delivered the service, are you saying that's the right time? You can, I mean, it, okay. once again, it's really depends on the product or service, mm -hmm. you know, people can be, um, uh, pretty excited about having made the decision, et cetera. Uh, but once again, there comes a point where you're manipulating the situation and it depends on the product or service you're mm -hmm. delivering for some people and the type of product you have, um, like for you and the work that you're doing, mo you really need to go through an implementation an onboarding and implementation mm -hmm. so that they, they've actually started working with you right? They see before you. they're going to be ready to provide a referral. So yes. it's, absolutely unique to the situation. Okay. Mm. And, um, so there's, you know, some people want to put you in this whole cookie cutter mold. Oh, do this and then do that. And then do this. Well, if you follow that cookie cutter mold, you could just alienate all your clients. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it really more thought <laughs> and energy needs to be put into this. Um, so that it fits your business and it fits mm. your customers, your client base, um, and that it's going to deliver the best results because mm. that's at the end of the day, it's how are you going to be move yourself forward and right. accelerate uh, your growth? Well, I am fascinated by even the statistics you use. I actually would have expected because I've been in groups where I hear people talking about referral systems, referral programs, et cetera, but a huge percentage of small businesses are like, no, we, we don't actually do anything well in regards to referrals. Right. Oh yeah. Well, so many people think it's that they got to offer all these different perks or refer a friend or this mm. and that. And that's just totally bogus. The best mm. types of referrals are when you're having that one-on-one -on -one conversation and, um, and that you have, you know, you've earned the right because of the business that you've been doing and the service that you're giving them and that you ask, for the referral. Yeah. Right. And uh, then you reward and recognize. And once people have begun and you've, they, you started asking, they'll start delivering more and more referrals to you. So, Hey uh, folks, you have to ask. I think that's yeah. Yeah. Don't ask, <laughs> don't get, you have to earn the right first. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, right. if, if you've delivered a crappy product, it was late, 
and yes. nobody ever called them back about their complaints. I, I would not ask, be asking for a referral. Okay. That's right. So yeah, if you're going to do clean it, all that up first, do it well. Yes. If you're going to do it, do it well, earn the right to ask. I love that. Um, so Lynn, out of respect for your time and for our listeners time, I'm going to ask you, where are you online and where do you like for people to connect with you? Well, the two easiest places are our website and that's mm -hmm. petite to the digit two queen.com. Mm -hmm. uh, tons of free resources, that masterclass, that free masterclass I talked about. Um, you can connect with me there. And I am the only Lynn Whitbeck on LinkedIn. And uh, about every six weeks, I offer a free workshop on LinkedIn. And I've got one, I've always got one coming up. So <laughs> yeah. you just, you can take a look there. Um, and you can also find me on my TV show that streams on Apple, Roku and Amazon fire. It's on the win, win women network. And it's called get more clients. Oh, I love it. Go check out. We'll share that. I would love to share a link to your TV show along with your website, LinkedIn, whatever you want to share. It looks like I've got a link to a free masterclass here. So folks, if you are listening, hop over to the show notes page. As always, you can find those at legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast. Lynn, so much fun chatting with you today about a range of topics. What what final either thoughts or action steps would you like to leave people with today? Start thinking like your client. They're the mm. ones who make the decision. They're the ones who pay you the money. So start thinking like your client. Yeah. So important. Like walk yourself through your own sales strategy as a client, right? Think about how that feels at each step of the way. Cause I think often we, we implement steps that we think are a good fit, but we don't actually slow down to be like, okay, I'm the client. Does this work? And alternatively, is there something else that would work better? Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. Thank you, Lynn. It's so great to connect with you today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Heather. It's been a pleasure. Anytime.